I've been wanting to go to Malaysia for quite a while, but personally, I've never met anybody that had actually been to Malaysia before. So I wasn't too sure about how I'd go about doing a few things, like for example, getting SIM cards, booking accommodation, flying to and from the country, etc., etc. So in today's video, I'm going to be sharing a comprehensive guide about my experience going to Malaysia and what I would encourage to myself prior to going on the trip, because I think it'll be valuable to those people that maybe have never been to Malaysia before and are curious about it like I was myself. So I went to Kuala Lumpur for five days. Going through immigration for me was really easy. I think for New Zealand citizens we can spend up to 90 days there on a tourist visa it might be 60 but I think it's either one of the two a little bit more than what Thailand is which is 30 days and when I was in the airport I was trying to determine whether or not I'd get a SIM card at the airport or maybe try sort it all out once I maybe got into the city of Kuala Lumpur but my impression was that at the airport you know the value for the SIM cards was actually pretty good and I was evaluating you know for the five days that I was there what would be the the best value SIM card for me to get and I didn't think getting unlimited data was really worth it because I was only going to be there for five days so the SIM card that I opted to get was this one, which gave me 15 gigabytes of data and I only needed to pay this much. I think it was like 25 Malaysian ringgit, which converts to, I think, just under 10 New Zealand dollars. And I think that was the correct decision because when I was actually in Kuala Lumpur, I literally don't remember ever seeing a like shop or place where they were actually selling SIM cards. And if you think about the value and what I actually got, you know, getting an actual SIM card itself and like the internet that I got for like 25 Malaysian ringgit, I think the likelihood of being able to get a SIM card cheaper was like pretty low. I don't really think I would have been able to get like 15 gigabytes of data for like, you know, less than like 15 Malaysian ringgit. So I think it was definitely worthwhile getting it at the airport in my experience. This was the provider that I used. I downloaded the application so I could track my, you know, internet usage while I was on my trip. And, you know, by the time I had left Malaysia, I had plenty of data left over. So, so I was very happy with that experience and my, you know, decision to get one at the airport. Now I consider this like next thing I'm about to share a bit of a trap. So from Kuala Lumpur, what I decided to do was actually catch the um, train service. It's kind of like an express train that takes you into the city. Now the amount that I needed to pay for that train service was uh, 55 Malaysian ringgit, which is pretty expensive because uh, you can actually get a car taxi from the Malaysian airport into like the same area uh, for about 65 Malaysian ringgit. So if you do get a car taxi, you know, you'll be able to be taken to the address that you actually want. Whereas if you catch the train, you'll be obviously just taken to the train station, which is probably not where your desired ending location is. You probably want to be going to, you know, your accommodation or wherever you want to go. It's probably not going to be the train station. So if you're traveling with multiple people, like say, for example, you're traveling with friends, your partner, your family, you're almost always better off getting a car taxi compared to, you know, paying 55 Malaysian ringgit for a ticket to catch the express train. When I was on the express train and I was actually looking at how much a grab would have cost, I was kind of in disbelief because, you know, almost always public transport is going to be cheaper than, you know, private transport or, or a taxi. So for the future, at least for me, I definitely won't be catching the express train to the airport. I'll definitely be getting a taxi. Now, in regards to accommodation, I actually didn't have the best experience in terms of value um, compared to Thailand and also even Bali for accommodation. I felt as though for my price range, which was probably under 40 New Zealand dollars per night, which I think is just over 100 Malaysian ringgit, there wasn't like a lot of good value for, for accommodation. A lot of people do say that Kuala Lumpur is one of the best places like in terms of value in the world, like you can get the most bang for your buck. But I get the impression that Kuala Lumpur isn't really designed for people like myself, maybe on a lower budget or like backpackers, so to speak. If you do have the price range of like 200 Malaysian ringgit per night or maybe more than 60 New Zealand dollars, that's where you can get some really, really nice places where you can stay. I personally stayed in two places. This was the first place I stayed. I didn't really have the best experience here. I feel as though um, this accommodation that I stayed in was a bit of a catfish, uh, if that makes sense. So like the photos looked a lot better than what they actually were. And the second place I stayed was in actually a local non-touristy area. So when um, I was actually getting a taxi to this accommodation from you know my other accommodation that was kind of a catfish, um, the taxi driver was saying, you know, this is a local area, not a lot of like tourists come to this, you know, accommodation or hotel, this area, whatever you want to call it. But personally, I actually kind of liked this accommodation. I mean, it was kind of like 20 minutes walking distance to be in like the downtown area of Kuala Lumpur. And I don't know, it's just kind of nice just being in the local area and seeing how like people experience their everyday lives in Kuala Lumpur. And I thought the value of this hotel that I stayed at was actually pretty good. So um, I'll leave a screenshot of like, you know, what it looked like and how much it was and if you want to check it out yourself. But in regards to booking in Kuala Lumpur and just in general, this is kind of my uh, formula or approach. So basically I will like filter which geographic area I'll want to stay in on uh, Google hotels. I'll just input, you know, Kuala Lumpur accommodation and then like I can use a map view to like indicate which area I want to stay in. And then I will filter the reviews so that way they are four star or higher. And then I will filter by lowest price. And then after I see a accommodation that I kind of like the look of, then I will read at least like 
five of the reviews and determine whether or not they're like authentic. And I'll also look at the most recent reviews and stuff like that. Now, in regards to getting around Kuala Lumpur, I actually didn't really use the train network. I think after my first experience of catching the express train, I was kind of put off by it. And I'd actually been to Bangkok prior to Kuala Lumpur. And I remember the whole process of trying to understand the train network kind of took a while. So what I opted to do was actually just use Grab, which is just like a rideshare app. It's basically the equivalent of Uber. You can get a pretty much a 30 minute taxi anywhere you want to in Kuala Lumpur for about nine to 10 New Zealand dollars. That was about the average price that I experienced. And in regards to food, there's quite a lot of variety and options. If you're looking for Western food or just like non-local food in Malaysia, you can go to you can go to one of the many malls that are in Malaysia. I think there's probably like over 15 malls that are actually in Kuala Lumpur. I know personally, I went to at least seven malls in Kuala Lumpur and I get the impression there's a lot more. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like more than 30 malls in Kuala Lumpur, which is pretty nuts if you think about it. At least coming from a New Zealander like myself, like in my you know city in Wellington, there's literally one mall. So, you know, going to Kuala Lumpur and like experiencing all the malls is pretty, pretty nuts to me anyway. But anyway, if you want Western food, you know, you can go to, you know, one of these malls and there's probably going to be pretty good value there. And then if you're wanting like a nasi lemak or any of the local Malaysian food, there's probably a restaurant nearly on every single block in Malaysia where you can experience, you know, local food. So um, depending on what your preference is, there's quite a lot of variety and options. I found Malaysia to be pretty easy to navigate and it was pretty straightforward. Um, there's probably two other things that I guess you could think about um, as well, like what card you're tr transacting with and also maybe your insurance if something does go wrong. I personally use Wise on my whole trip around Asia just for um, transacting, you know, foreign currencies. I probably spent just under 500 New Zealand dollars when I was in Kuala Lumpur. So maybe I'll do like a breakdown of how much I saved using Wise comparatively to my bank here in New Zealand with, with ANZ. If you want to see how I use WISE, what I might do is leave like a video tutorial here about explaining, you know, how I use it and why I use it. And the insurance provider I was using when I was in Malaysia was Safety Wing. Pretty much how it works is Safety Wing will ask you which countries you were traveling to. And depending on your age and, you know, for how long you're traveling, they'll give you a quote about how much your travel insurance will cost. And they also display, you know, uh, what the perks and, you know, what they offer in regards to insurance if something does go wrong. So I opted to use them on my trip. If you're curious about Safety Wing, I made a video explaining how it works and why I use it and stuff like that. So if that's of any interest to you, I'll leave the card or, or link above. And if you want to see my full comprehensive guide about traveling to Thailand, you can watch the video here.